for time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker, and good morning. My question today is for the Premier. Last week, we learned that nine companies built Ontario Electricity customers out of $265 million. Now we know one of those companies is run by your government, Ontario Power Generation. OPG's turn at the trough cost electricity payers tens of millions of dollars in inappropriate expenses. That's after your government, Premier, was warned five times about the program that OPG was abusing. So, Speaker, my question to the Premier is this. Did her government ignore warnings from the Energy Board because they enjoyed collecting the money that OPG was wrongfully taking from electricity customers? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're confident in the Ontario Energy Board and our system operator to run an efficient, uh, reliable, and fair electricity market for ratepayers across the province. And both the real-time generation cost guarantee program and the congestion management settlement credit play an extremely important role uh, in our electricity system, Mr. Speaker. These programs are required to keep the electricity uh, system reliable for families and businesses across the province and uh, stable for our neighbours in other jurisdictions. If these programs were eliminated, reliability would be put at risk. When it comes to OPG, Mr. Speaker, they released a statement, and what they said was, uh, in respect of uh, some of what they thought were eligible costs, OPG repaid certain costs, claimed amounts after discussions cl concluded on what constituted eligible costs. Answer. OPG promptly repaid the amounts to the ISO in full in 2015. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. The Minister of Energy may be confident in OPG, but the people of Ontario and the official opposition have no confidence, none, in this government to keep a watchful eye on what's happening, especially in the energy sector. The Energy Board issued five warnings to four different ministers of energy and two different premiers about the program that OPG was abusing. The government ignored all of them, Mr. Speaker. Now we find out that the government benefited to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. This at a time when electricity prices were skyrocketing. 600,000 Ontarians were behind on their bills. 60,000 were being cut off. Speaker, four ministers were warned, and three of them are still in Premier Wynne's cabinet. Question. How much would electricity ratepayers have to be out before the Premier finally held someone accountable? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Abuses within the system are completely unacceptable, and that's why the system operator has investigated those market participants and where significant wrongdoing was present. Compensation has been recovered and returned to ratepayers. $168 million of the $200 million in ineligible costs has been recovered by the uh, ISO, Mr. Speaker. The total annual cost for the real-time generator cost guarantee program are now $23 million, down significantly from $61 in 2015. 2014, Mr. Speaker, and also according to the December 2016 Market Surveillance Panel report, many of the most problematic issues associated with the congestion management settle settlement credit regime have been brought to an end, in large measure as a result of the panel having identified these situations and the ISO having acted to eliminate them. The Auditor Answer. General says our system operator doesn't act when the board's Market Surveillance Panel makes a recommendation, but the panel itself disagreed, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, the energy minister said a lot right there, but what he didn't say was that he was going to go back and try and get the $92 million that's still outstanding. Electricity, electricity customers in Ontario have overpaid by that much. And energy minister after energy minister after energy minister after energy minister, four of them. And two premiers sat by idly and did nothing despite the warnings. As late as September 2016, ISO was still being told at public meetings that this program was a problem. When we tried to have the Justice Committee review the ISO this October, what did the government do? They said no and stood firmly against accountability. The Liberals didn't want electricity customers to know that they were benefiting from this abuse of the program. Speaker, the premier has shown that she thinks she's above accountability. Does she actually think she's Question. above the law, too? Mr. Speaker, 
As stated before, abuses within the system are completely unacceptable, and that's why we have our system operator act on these programs, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the system operator investigated those market participants where there was significant market uh, uh, wrongdoing present. Compensation has been recovered, and it has been returned to ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. And one of the most egregious, they were fined a record $10 million, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we can recoup those costs for excuse me, for all ratepayers. But again, Mr. Speaker, more program uh, updates are on the way in form of market renewal, Mr. Speaker. That again is rebuilding the foundation and which will also increase the flexibility and efficiency within Ontario's electricity market, Mr. Speaker. The market renewal ish initiative is expected to result in more competitive marketplace Answer. that meets our system needs while increasing flexibility and efficiencies and will always rely on the OEB and the system operator Thank to you. keep the system in check. New question. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is uh, also for the Premier. Last week, the member from Barrie lashed out at small business owners concerned about the impact of a 32 per cent increase in the minimum wage. She told business owners that they shouldn't be operating if they can't afford it. A member of this government thinks struggling business owners should just shut up and close their doors. Speaker, is that the official position of this government, or will the Premier insist the member from Barrie apologize to all struggling business owners across this province? Thank you, Premier. The Speaker, and as the member of This could be the beginning. Very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the member opposite knows, I was uh, I was not here uh, last week. I was actually overseas, Mr. Speaker, in China and Hong Kong and Vietnam, Mr. Speaker. Over two billion dollars worth of economic activity, over two thousand new jobs, Mr. Speaker, for Ontario. So it was a very successful trade mission. I am, however, very happy to be back to answer the member opposite's question and to say that even though I wasn't here, I am 100% certain, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Barrie supports small business in her community and across the province, Mr. Speaker, and she also, she also supports a fair society where people can earn a living wage, Mr. Speaker, and can look after themselves here, and look here. after their Answer. families. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. No, 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 did, 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 did. Just calming everything down. Member, sup? Everything's Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Shockingly, that wasn't the most ridiculous comment the member made that day. <laughs> Lawrence Vindham is closing his butcher shop because he can't afford to operate in Liberal Ontario. And the member from Barrie responds by alleging he is closing his shop and blaming the Liberals. Why? because he's a progressive conservative. She believes Mr. Vindham is going out of business because of some grand PC party conspiracy to blame it on the Liberals. That is absolutely ludicrous. Mr. Vindham is heartbroken because his former employees are without jobs weeks before Christmas. Her comments were disrespectful. They were shameful. Speaker, Mr. Vindham deserves an apology and an explanation. We'd love to hear that right now. Thank you. Speaker, we are thrilled that there are small businesses and medium-sized businesses across this province that are thriving, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, there were a hundred delegates who travelled with us on our trade mission, Mr. Speaker. There was young one young man, his name was Chad Jakeman, Mr. Speaker, and he processes maple syrup. And he went to Vietnam with us, Mr. Speaker. He signed a deal in Vietnam to bring Canadian Ontario maple syrup into Vietnam, Mr. Speaker. That's a small business. And Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything in our power to support small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We are all 
also we are also working to make sure that the people who shop at those small businesses mr speaker the people who are the customers of those small businesses can look after themselves can feed their families mr speaker and can actually and can actually yes, go into those businesses in Barrie and across the province and buy the products that those small businesses are selling mr speaker final supplementary thank you back to the premier the member from Barrie isn't alone she might truly believe that businesses should close if they can't afford to oper under, operate under your government's policies. Her colleague from Mississauga Streetsville called the people who feel the impact of Bill 148 bad actor employers. Oh, nice. wow. The member for Beaches East York said they need to rethink their business plan. And the Minister of Labour said they should simply raise their prices. It's clear the Liberal policy is to tell business owners in Ontario it's our way or the highway. They don't care about the jobs these businesses provide, and they don't care if these businesses close. Speaker, how many more Liberal, other Liberal members have told businesses in their ridings just to simply close their doors? Mr. Speaker, I really believe that underlying this question is another question, and that, that is, does this member and does this party support a minimum wage, Mr. Speaker, that is a living wage. Do you support $14 an hour, Mr. Speaker? Do you support $15 an hour? Because the reality is, Mr. Speaker, our economy is thriving. Ontario is leading economic growth in the country, Mr. Speaker. Now is the time to increase the minimum wage so the people who are struggling to get by, Mr. Speaker, actually can make ends meet. And I think that it's important that the party opposite make it clear to the people of Ontario whether they support Support an increased minimum wage, or whether they do not support they an increased do not. minimum wage. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The signaling has been very clear. We're in warnings. And I'm all over it. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe that prepaid hydrometers should be long in Ontario? Does she believe that we should have prepaid hydrometers in this province? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Protecting Ontario's energy consumers and ensuring greater fairness across the energy system are the top priorities uh, of this government. Hydro One, as we said before, Mr. Speaker, over the last few weeks. The member from Lanark, from Lanark and Addington is warned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As said before, Hydro One is exploring this technology as an effort to ensure more customer choice. This is part of a proposal that is before the Ontario Energy Board, who have to approve this technology before it's even allowed to be used, Mr. Speaker. And the Ontario Energy Board makes decisions and rules to ensure that consumers are treated fairly, and they will factor this in when they make their decision about this new technology. But let me repeat that, Mr. Speaker. Even if this technology is ever approved by the Ontario Board, uh, Ontario Energy Board, customers will have to opt in to be part of this program. Answer. Also, no residential customer will be without power during the winter months, regardless of any type of meter um, that they choose to have in the Thank future. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, Hydro One has filed paperwork to force families who are already struggling with sky-high hydro bills to feed the meter before they can turn on their lights. I want to ban prepaid meters from Ontario. That's why this afternoon I will be introducing a bill to do exactly that. Will the Premier of this province agree and support a ban on prepaid hydrometers in our province? Thank you. Minister. Again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, um, even if this technology is approved by the OEB, Mr. Speaker, and the OEB will review this, and the OEB's, OEB's mandate is to ensure that they have the ratepayers' best interests at heart, Mr. Speaker. Even if they were to actually approve this, customers will then have the. 
The member from Timmins James Bay is warned. Again, Mr. Speaker, then it's up to the customers to choose if this is something that they would like. If this is something that they want, Mr. Speaker, then the customer can opt in to be part of this program. Also, as stated, no residential customer will be without power during the winter months. Um, this is just one of the initiatives, Mr. Speaker, that the options that Hydro One is examining to offer their customers more choice Answer. on how they can manage their electricity accounts. It's important to note that this project, again, is still being reviewed by the OEB, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Prepay utility meters were installed in homes across the UK under Margaret Thatcher. Yep. They were so disastrous for family speaker that they banned them. They subsequently banned them from that country. Yet this Liberal Premier seems bent on allowing privatized Hydro One to use prepaid meters here in Ontario. A lot of people might be surprised and disappointed to see the Premier following in the footsteps of Margaret Thatcher, but then again, I don't remember her campaigning on selling off Hydro One either. Will this Premier do the right thing and agree to ban prepaid Margaret Thatcher-style hydro meters in our province? Mr. Speaker, when that party had the right thing, opportunity to do the right thing and vote in favour of giving everyone a 25 per cent reduction, they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. It was this party, it was this government, Mr. Speaker, that introduced the Energy Consumer Protection Act and updated uh, it in 2015 by banning door-to-door -door sales for energy contracts, increasing consumer representation in the Ontario Energy Board proceedings, and enhancing the authority of the OEB to further protect electricity ratepayers by boosting in consumer protection. We have made sure that we've acted on behalf of the people of Ontario. We've brought forward initiatives that will protect them, Mr. Speaker, and we've brought forward a program that actually reduced their rates by 25 per cent. And even more, Mr. Speaker, if they're low-income individuals or individuals that live in rural or northern parts of the province. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, yes, sir. they're talking about a pie-in-the-sky program that didn't even consider First Nations are low-income individuals, you. Mr. Thank Speaker. You. We acted to make sure that we protected those people. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. For the uh, Premier Speaker, the privatized Hydro One has applied for many rate increases already, including a plan that will hurt First Nations communities in the far north. It's also planning to invest more than $6 billion in a dirty, coal-burning American power company, instead of putting that money to work right here in Ontario, upgrading our power system for Ontario families. And now, instead of respecting the ban on wintertime connections, Hydro One is trying to find a way around it. Why is this Premier still defending this private, for-profit company that so clearly is not working in the best interests of families and businesses in Ontario. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is no way around the law, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One cannot find a way around the winter, winter disconnection program, Mr. Speaker. The law is in place. There will be no winter disconnections once it starts. They make it up as they go along, Mr. Speaker. That's very clear. When it comes to a, a, a Vista, Mr. Speaker, um, as we said before, rates won't be affected here in Ontario. It won't affect local jobs either, and it doesn't affect um, the, the, the maintenance that Hydro One is doing on a day-to-day -day maintenance, make, uh, day -to -day, uh, maintenance of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, making sure that we have some of the cleanest and most reliable power in North America because, Mr. Speaker, we no longer have coal on our system, and we're working to continue to have um, a partner, Mr. Speaker, and that's what Hydro One is doing. Yes, sir. When you look at Avista, they've made sure that they're lowering their consumption, but when it comes to being the tip of the spear, everyone looks Thank to you. Ontario to be the example that they want to represent. Last week, the Minister of Economic Development and Growth said this about prepay hydrometers, and I quote, they're not evil. There's nothing that affects vulnerable people in any way about this. That's not true, Speaker. When someone gets behind on their hydro payments right now, the hydro companies will work with that person. They'll work with that fi family to try to find an appropriate repayment schedule that works with that person's budget. But with a prepay meter, the option is completely removed. It's either feed the meter or go without power. That's what's going to happen. 
How can this premier actually endorse a plan that means vulnerable families could actually have their hydro cut off? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was this Premier who actually created a plan, who worked on a plan that actually helped low-income families reduce their bills by 25 per cent or even more, Mr. Speaker, and it's that party that voted against it. It's this Premier and this government that worked on a plan that brought forward a 40 to 50 per cent reduction for those northern and rural customers, and it's that party that voted against it, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to protecting ratepayers, when it comes to having the best interests of the people of Ontario at heart, it's this Premier and this government, Mr. Speaker, and the actions that we have taken are representative of that fact, Mr. Speaker. When the opposition can continue to vote against things and fearmonger, that's the scary thing, Mr. Speaker, because at the end of the day, there is no such plan in place. It is being looked at right now. The OEB is considering it, and if it is considered, Mr. Speaker, if it is considered by the OEB, then it is an opt-in program, and people will choose it if it its benefit for them and nobody else, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, premier, prepay meters are also extremely expensive to install. This Liberal government has already wasted millions on not-so-smart meters. I can't understand why they would want to repeat that unfortunate incident again. The bottom line is that the private energy system in Ontario isn't working for families or businesses in this province. Rates have gone up 300 per cent under this government. Power producers are gaming Liberal energy regulators for millions, and the private Hydro One wants to install prepay meters that would hurt vulnerable Ontarians. Will this Premier support a ban on Margaret Thatcher-style prepay hydro meters in our province? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Thatcher is in Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I need to repeat, there is no prepaid plan coming into place. The OEB is reviewing it, Mr. Speaker, and they will then make a decision. If the decision of the OEB, Mr. Speaker, is to allow this to move forward, they will then do this with the decision of making sure that they're keeping the best interests of ratepayers at heart. It is their mandate, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they keep costs as low as possible for all ratepayers. And if they do decide to do this, Mr. Speaker, and that's our quasi-judicial organization that makes sure that they look at the impacts that this will have on ratepayers, if they make that decision, then it is still the customer's choice, Mr. Speaker, if this is something that they want to do. There is no backroom movement, Mr. Speaker, like the NDP constantly say will happen. Yes, this is a plan that people will have an opportunity to choose to do if it actually gets approved and moved forward by the OEB, Mr. Speaker. There Thank still you. is nothing moving forward on this. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This morning, the Financial Accountability Office released another indictment of this government. They said, quote, additional measures to raise revenue or lower spending will be required if the province intends to achieve a balanced budget. The Premier called the media from China to say she can't understand how anyone can find any savings. Yet last week, the Auditor General found $1 billion in savings in one report alone in just 14 uh, programs. Speaker, the PC plan will look to save two cents on every dollar that is spent. Speaker, to the Premier, why is this government mired in waste, scandal and mismanagement instead of helping Ontario's families? Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I want to thank the, uh, the FAO for his report, Mr. Speaker. Um, he actually confirms that Ontario's economy is growing, and he expects this yes, growth to continue, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Um, he also confirmed that under the accounting presentation that we've been using for the last 16 years, Mr. Speaker, the budget is balanced, and in fact, there's a small surplus for 2017-18, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Surplus. So. The report actually shows that our plan is working, um, the economy is growing, our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 17 years, Mr. Speaker, and more than 843,000 net new jobs have been created since the recession. Um, 
But, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that we continue to work to create more fairness in this province, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that there are still people who are not feeling the benefit of that uh, economic growth, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly yes, why it's exactly why we're raising the minimum wage, Mr. Speaker. Exactly why OHIP Plus will be in place as of January 1st, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And it's a, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Well, the FAO delivered a blistering indictment, uh, pre uh, Speaker, so it's obvious that the Premier read a different report than everybody else. The PC plan is different than the Liberal plan. The Financial Accountability Office said that government must either raise revenues or lower spending. Now, the Ontario PC plan will find two cents on every dollar through eliminating waste this government doesn't even believe exists. The Premier says savings are impossible. Well, if they can't see how to lower spending, uh, Speaker, then the Premier must be raising taxes. So, Speaker, to the Premier, will we know before or after the election which taxes they intend to raise? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is part of a party that has promised that they would cut $12 billion out of health care and education and services in this province, Mr. Speaker. $12 billion. That would mean that in every community across this province, Mr. Speaker. In every community across this province, Mr. Speaker, the impact of those cuts would be felt. So, if the member opposite is asking whether we support cutting $12 billion out of no program and services in this province, Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. no. We're very appreciative of the FAO's report. We're very appreciative that he recognizes the economic growth that we're seeing in this province, that he recognizes that the budget is balanced, Answer. Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to invest in the province and not cut $12 billion out of it. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Last week, Holly Pataya went to Brampton Civic Hospital. She was diagnosed with pneumonia. At that very scary moment, when she needed a hospital bed, she was told that Brampton Civic Hospital was too overcrowded. They could not take any more patients. Just imagine, Speaker, having pneumonia and being told that you can't get a hospital bed being told that the hospital is so overcrowded that it cannot help you. Holly was sent by ambulance to the emergency department at Etobicoke General. That's where she spent two days and a night in a crowded hallway with many other patients in a warning sign rather than an isolation room. Why is this Premier letting down people like Holly by failing to stop the crisis of hallway medicine inside Ontario overcrowded hospitals? Question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for this question. And uh, we strive to have the very best health care system uh, in the country. Speaker, we actually do have the very best health care system in the country, but we know we constantly need to respond. To, uh, to increases in uh, population, Speaker, to other factors that increase demand on hospitals. And that is exactly why uh, we're investing $140 million wow. in the hospital, home, and community sectors wow. to open new beds, new spaces to meet the, uh, to meet the needs of patients, and build Good. capacity up across the continuum. We have an excellent health care system. People in Ontario rely on it. They know it is excellent, but we need to be constantly responding to the changing demand, and that's exactly what we are doing. Here, here. Here. Thank you. Supplementary. The Premier's temporary bed are not a real solution. Holly knows that. Respected health care experts are saying the exact same thing. Take Dr. Paul Pajot, president of the Canadian Associations of Emergency Physicians, and, I quote, says, Funding for temporary beds does not seem to match up with what a normal hospital bed would be funded at. Dr. Doris Grinspoon, CEO of RNAO, says, and I quote, we will not succeed at staffing those surge capacity beds because people want permanent full-time work, not part-time position that only lasts a few months. 
Why won't this Premier listen to the patient, listen to the leaders in health care, and fund permanent beds with full-time nurses that Ontario need to stop this dangerous overcrowding in our hospitals? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, maybe these numbers speak for themselves. We're making over 2,000 additional beds and spaces wow. available this year to improve wow. access to care for patients and families and to reduce wait times. That includes 1,200 additional hospital beds, Speaker. That is the equivalent of building six new hospitals, wow. Speaker. Yeah, so uh, in addition to that, uh, we're building affordable housing for seniors who need additional support so they can get out of the hospital and into a home and make room for someone who needs that hospital care, Speaker. We're creating transitional care spaces for up to 1,700 patients wow. who don't require care in a hospital. We're reopening 150 beds at Humber River Hospital, a, 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 a decision that that party ridiculed, Speaker. We're opening 150 beds and 75 more beds at UHN's former health care site. We are committed to ensuring excellent care. Yeah. Your question, the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. I, along with my resident of Scarborough Agent Court, was closely watching the government's trade mission to China and Vietnam. These missions are always exciting because they not only promote Ontario on a global schedule, scale, they bring foreign investment, fuel economic growth, and enhancing research collaboration. They also highlight the great talents we're building right here in Ontario. With greater access to diverse markets come greater opportunities for Ontario businesses, workers, and consumers. In Ontario alone, Mr. Speaker, the international exports accounts for 36 per cent of the GDP. Speaker, Scarborough Asian Court residents know that diversifying our trading partners with the goods and services in which we trade is paramount. Our government's plan to diversify our trade is an inter integral part of Prosperous Ontario, and we're not seeing this being implemented right now. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please share with the House the success of the recent trade mission to China and Vietnam? Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, great to be home. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Adrian Court for asking this question. Now more than ever, Speaker, Ontario's priority must lie in diversifying our trade routes. It's why the Premier and I, along with a delegation of over 100 businesses, wow. travel to China and wow. Vietnam. This was the third Premier-led mission to China and Ontario's first ever trade mission to Vietnam. Delegates met with local companies and institutions through the many business-to-business -business session and site visit. This mission spanned seven different cities with focused delegations in medical technology, science and technology, and the ag food sector. Speaker, overall, the trade mission illustrates Ontario's world-class education system, our competitive Answer. business environment, talented workforce, and leadership in developing innovative technologies. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for this response. It is remarkable to hear Ontario expanding the global footprint. I know that such achievement positive affect all of Ontario, and especially my constituent Scarborough Asian Court. With China being Ontario's second largest single nation trading partner, and Vietnam is a growing nation bursting with potentials, Ontario is taking full advantage throughout trade missions to create new relationships and strengthen existing bonds. I was very excited, Mr. Speaker, to hear Ontario help meetings with BYD, Genzy, and Johnson Electrics. These businesses have committed to continue growing their businesses here in Ontario, fundamentally demonstrating a stronger confidence in our economy and our talented workforce. These trade missions, Mr. Speaker, are tangible evidence of a province that Ontario businesses are working together to demonstrate opportunities for growth here in Ontario. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please Question. inform the House the achievements made during these trade missions that will directly affect Ontario's workforce? Thank you, Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm very, very proud to announce that Ontario companies and institutions signed an unprecedented amount of agreements where they at about 2.3 billion wow. to create and expect 2,300 jobs in our province. Speaker, I would like to highlight a few of our accomplishments. Number one, 
a subsidiary of Fearher International, will set up Kingston's first baby formula production facility, which will recreate up to 277 jobs. Wow. Wow. Senior Glass Holdings has selected Ontario for its North American facility with 450 million investment. Wow. Amway China will be hosting their 25th anniversary leadership seminar in Ontario. This event is expected to bring 10,000 people here in Ontario. Speaker, our government is at the forefront of business and we are prepared Thank to you. navigate new opportunities. Thank you, Speaker. Question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, as our St. Mary's Hospital cardiac care providers earn national recognition for some of the best cardiac services in Canada, patients in the Waterloo region are wondering where their Liberal government is to support those services. January will mark another calendar year with patients still facing long wait times before getting bust out of the region for cardiac electrophysiology. It also marks five years, five years since the Liberal government promised funding for an urgently needed, still undelivered EP lab at St. Mary's. Five Speaker, years. the People's Guarantee prioritizes cardiac care with a commitment to expand cardiac centers in the province. Will the Premier end the dangerous waiting game and commit to expand Waterloo Region cardiac care, shovels in the ground for the St. Mary's EP lab before the year is out, 2017? <laughs> Thank you, Premier. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I know that the uh, the minister will be more than happy to uh, answer the specifics of St. Mary's, but I do know that that is a project that is is underway. But I know that uh, I know that the member opposite will be very interested to hear, generally speaking, about our health care system and how we're doing when it comes to wait times. The Fraser Institute has uh, recently announced how Ontario is doing relative to other provinces, Speaker. Right. We are only one of two provinces in Canada to improve from 2016 to 2017. We have the shortest wait times from GP to specialist, the shortest wait times in the country from specialist to treatment. We have the shortest wait times for CT scans and the shortest wait times for MRIs. We have the shortest wait Answer. time for ultrasounds, the shortest wait times for radiation oncology, the shortest wait times for general surgery, and the shortest uh, wait times for gynecological previews. I know this. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, cardiac patients in the Waterloo, mm -hmm. Wellington, Lynn, and surrounding area are continuing to wait and wait and wait. And so, how many times do we have to stand up? Stop the clock. The member from Kitchener Centre is warned. Question. How many times do we have to stand up to this Liberal government just to get the vital services that they, in fact, committed to in 2012? How many more patient bus trips out of the region? How many more rides will this government take us on that end back where we started? Despite ministry staff admitting in committee that, yes, there would be a letter at the time approving the project last year, no tenders have gone out to move, in fact, us ahead. In fact, since then, the ministry has used a separate St. Mary's request on top of the undelivered EP lab as an excuse to move the entire project, in fact, right back to the starting line. Let me make this simple to the Premier. This cardiac EP lab had already Question. been approved. The Liberals promised it back in 2012 and again in 2016. Will the Premier tell the people of Waterloo Region exactly when their promised critical care cardiac Thank lab you. will be up and running? Well, Speaker, as, as I said, this, this is a project that is moving forward. We've put $7 million wow. and the tendering work is underway. But let's think about what would happen under a PC government if they were to be elected, Speaker. They promised, they promised $12 billion in cuts. Some of that must come from health care, Speaker. They've promised 15,000 long-term care beds, but have allocated money for 1,000. Promise 15, money for I have a handful I could actually warn. To make a historic uh, investment in mental health. From Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry is warned. They 
the historic investment in mental health. That investment is one fraction, one fifth of what we have done Answer. over the last one fifth of what we have done over the last ten years. The only thing historic Thank about you. it is it says historically. Thank you. Uh, New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, students across Ontario will forever remember 2017 as the year they gave up their dreams of a college education because of the Premier's refusal to use her influence and legislative authority to facilitate college collective bargaining. Following the December 5th deadline for tuition refunds, the media's report— Stop the clock. Member from Ancaster, Dundas, South, uh, Glengarry, Westdale, is warned. Finish. The media is reporting that thousands of college students have asked for their money back and are dropping out altogether. We don't know exactly how many because the government is stalling on releasing the tuition refund numbers nearly a week after the deadline. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to know the full impact of this government's inaction to end the college strike. Will the Premier release the tuition refund numbers today? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development is going to want to speak to the specifics. But let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that I know that there are uh, there are students and uh, professors and instructors all over the province, Mr. Speaker, who are working to make up that time. And it was unfortunate that students were out of the classroom, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know that they are working very, very hard to uh, to get all of that work uh, in place, Mr. Speaker. But I think what's interesting is that a member of the New Democratic Party is proposing that we should have used legislative authority earlier in the process to undercut the collective bargaining process, Mr. Speaker. That really is a pretty counterintuitive, uh, a counterintuitive position for, uh, for an NDP uh, member to take, Mr. Speaker. But, I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, that we, uh, we support all of the young people, all the students who are working hard now, and we wish them all the best. And there is funding, and I know Thank that the, member, uh, the minister will speak to that in the supplementary. supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I want the Premier to know that facilitating collective bargaining is very different from legislating workers. Speaker, here's what we know from the media. More than 1,500 students have withdrawn from Centennial. One third have no plans to return. Close to 2,000 students have withdrawn from Fanshawe, and about half do not plan to return. 1,200 students have withdrawn from Conestoga, 1,200 from St. Clair, 1,100 from Georgian, nearly 1,000 each from Mohawk and Niagara, almost 1,200 students from the five Northern Ontario College, which is more than double the average attrition rate. There's there's likely to be another wave of withdrawals before semester two from students who attempted the first semester but struggled with the compressed content. Speaker, Question. think of the huge loss of talent this represents. Does this Liberal government have a plan to support these students to return to college? Thank you. Education and skills development. Minister of Education well, and Skills Development. Speaker, I have to say I am mystified by this question because that was the party who time and time and time again voted against getting students back to the classroom. That's what they did. Everyone was here. Hansard actually records that the NDP on record. Member from London West. Is warning. The seat mate, mate is there too. Pretty close. The NDP is on one hand on record as, as saying that they would never legislate back ever. So we'd still have a strike. And then we hear we should have used those legislative tools earlier and legislated them back earlier, Speaker. The important thing is. The students suffered from this. We've given them the opportunity to do what is right for them. That some of them have chosen to withdraw, Speaker, and they got full tuition refund. Sir. They can restart. We are encouraging that, Speaker. We want them back in college, and colleges want them back. So we're going to work together to get students Thank you. who did choose to drop out to. Uh... Thank you. New question: The member from Etobicoke North. 
Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs, Marie-France Lalande. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to express my pride with respect to our government, who is doing all that it can to give Franco-Ontarians the necessary tools to reach their full potential. Government has made uh, the question of equity very important. This will make sure make sure that more than 600,000 Franco-Ontarians continue to play an integral role in our province in French. Can the minister remind us of our commitment towards the Franco-Ontarian population? The minister. Thank you. I would like to thank the member of, of Etobicoke North for his question. For several months, the Franco-Ontarian population has seen many advances. Through its uh, various ministries, the government has strengthened this community. I would like to think of the advances made in health with a, a, an assistant deputy ministry minister who deals with French exclusively. There's been a pilot project that's made, been made permanent with respect to access to French language services. There has been uh, more investment in culture. We have uh, moved towards uh, making the Francophone University a reality, and there's also a new fund dedicated to Francophones, which will provide uh, much uh, important work on the international scale. I would like to thank uh, Kathleen Wynne, who's working with Franco-Ontarians. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for her dedication and for this substantial list uh, of things we've done for Franco-Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt that it's thanks to our government that Franco-Ontarians are best situated. This government continues to show its concrete commitment towards Franco-Ontarians. Can the Minister of Francophone Affairs tell us more about the importance of Franco-Ontarians for our government, the minister. Again, I would like to thank the member, the member for Etobicoke North for his question. He's always been the voice of Franco-Ontarians for his community and for Franco-Ontarians throughout the province. I'd like to say to you, Mr. Speaker, that I noticed a small little paragraph that's part of the magazine that was presented by the party opposite. And I would like to say, say how disappointed I was to learn that there was no vision for Franco-Ontarians. The official opposition has mentioned the Francophone University, a major project of our government. It's already underway. All we see in the party opposite's commitment are vague reference, references that show an ignorance towards the needs of Franco-Ontarians. I would like to assure you, Mr. Speaker, that our government remains committed concretely towards the Franco-Ontarian community. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. This morning's Globe and Mail article reinforced what many of us have known for years. If you need mental health care in Ontario, you will end up on a waiting list. According to a study in the Canadian Mental Medical Association Journal, the majority of people treated in emergency after a suicide attempt are not seen by a psychiatrist for six months. Wow. Mental health needs to be treated as seriously as physical health, yet in Ontario, people are waiting months for their first appointment. Under the People's Guarantee, the Progressive Conservative Party has made a commitment of $1.9 billion additionally from mental health services. Here, here. Understanding that people are not getting the care they need when they need it, Will the Premier match our commitment? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I know that the Deputy Premier will want to comment in the supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, the fact is that um, the promise that the uh, party opposite has made is woefully inadequate. Over the last woefully. 10 years, Mr. Speaker, we've invested $10 billion, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to invest, Mr. Speaker, in uh, mental health supports across this province. We know, we know, Mr. Speaker, that there is more that, uh, that has to be done. Over the last decade, there has been a huge 
hugely uh, increased awareness of mental health in this province and, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, across the country. So we will continue to make record investments in mental health as we have done for the last uh, decade, Mr. Speaker. And to suggest that $1.9 billion is adequate, Mr. Speaker, as an increase over the next uh, number of years Answer. is just it's just not it's not adequate mr speaker and we need to continue to make increased investments supplementary if you don't think 1.9 billion dollars in additional funding for mental health services in ontario is going to make a difference you need to get out of queens park and talk to the families it's an odd request of a member from the same place where the question is coming from, not to heckle the member that's asking the question. It's kind of odd. Finish, please. You need to talk to the families who are desperate for help. You need to talk to the individuals who are waiting on those wait lists, who've had a suicide attempt, Premier, and they don't get to see anyone for six months. Chair, please. 1.9 additional billion dollars in additional funding for mental health. The study outlines that only 40 percent of those who attempted suicide saw a psychiatrist within six months of their emergency room visit. That's 45,000 individuals in Ontario without the care they need when they need it. Question. Ontario's mental health system is in crisis, and that's why Patrick Brown and the PC party have committed to the largest Good. provincial investment in mental health in Canadian Thank you. history. That Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the fact is that uh, mental health has been a, a hidden. Uh, it's been a hidden issue in the health care system for decades, Mr. Speaker. That's, that's the reality. So there's actually no argument uh, among any of us in this House that there needs to be increased funding, which is why, Mr. Speaker, over the last decade, we've invested $10 billion, Mr. Wow. Speaker. So, you know, we, we continue to increase the amount of funding that goes into mental health supports. So when I say that $1.9 billion is inadequate, Mr. Speaker, I mean just that. I mean that there is going to need to be increased funding over the next The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will withdraw. And now the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Anyone else want to comment? Good. Premier, you may finish. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there needs to be increased funding over the next decade. And, Mr. Speaker, we have, uh, we have made commitments. You can look at our record, $10 billion over the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker, and that funding will continue to increase. That is over and above, Mr. Speaker, the money that, uh, that was committed. We will continue to invest in mental health because it is increasingly a challenge Thank across you. the province to meet the needs. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Two years ago, in 2015, a riot resulted in a hostage taking of a corrections officer at the, Toronto, or at the Thunder Bay Jail. In May, the minister said that a new jail was coming to replace the badly overcrowded, wholly inadequate 100-year-old facility there. How much longer do the corrections officers, the staff and inmates have to continue to struggle in a jail that's considered a powder keg? Community Safety and Correctional Services. District Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank the member uh, for her question. And certainly, every time an incident occurs in any of our institutions, uh, it gives me great concerns and certainly uh, a desire to, to see how we can improve the situation. And, and you know, when I look at the work that in the past few months that we've worked very closely with each institution, each of our uh, correction officers, men and women, uh, correction staff that works in our institutions in, in, in improving, in working together. We committed to transformation change and we made a commitment to bring forward a brand new facility in Thunder Bay and we are working very closely with local representatives from the jail and Answer. area uh, individual. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, for me, in moving forward in correction, it means transformation, and not only just saying it, but Thank acting you. on it. Supplementary. Speaker, there was a rally last week in Thunder Bay because nothing has changed in terms of the conditions of that jail. When I was in Thunder Bay last week, I learned that all of the conditions that led to the riot, the hostage shaking, and the years long isolation of Adam Cape still exist at the Thunder Bay Jail. The 100 year old Thunder Bay Jail is not designed for the number of inmates that it houses. There are staff shortages, inadequate equipment, and no sign that this Liberal government is doing anything but pushing the problem down the road. When can the people of Thunder Bay expect shovels in the ground on their new facility? Thank you. Minister. So, so Mr. Speaker, uh, let me be very, very clear. We have agreed that the system needed to change. The system needs improvement. We have not shy away from this. This is actually why we brought in an independent reviewer, Mr. Howard Sapers, who brought us recommendation, and we are working through those recommendations in not, not, in not only acknowledging that we need to bring infrastructure to the system, but also bringing new legislation, changing the way we identified, for instance, segregation. Mr. Speaker, I was also very proud of being part of an award recognition where the Premier and I attended, where we recognized the great courageous work that took place on that special night in Thunder Bay with all these wonderful workers that worked that night. And we did this Answer. because we appreciate and value the work. We made the announcement for new infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and we will, meet, we will be moving forward in that transformation. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, last month, leaders from around the world attended the COP23 in Germany to discuss solutions to climate change. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change was in attendance and was able to share Ontario's environmental initiatives on the world stage. The minister participated in the first international meeting of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance and was able to showcase Ontario's actions to eliminate coal, including shutting down coal-fired generation in Ontario. That action alone is one of the largest ever greenhouse gas reduction initiatives in North America. It's equivalent to taking 7 million vehicles off the roads. Speaker, can the minister please describe Ontario's role as an international leader in reducing smog and greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, hardworking member from, from uh, Barrie for her very important question. Speaker, last month I was honoured to stand with our uh, federal government and, and international partners uh, in making a commitment to phase out the use of coal to generate power. I was especially proud to represent a jurisdiction that has made it a top priority to reduce carbon in the production of our electricity. Speaker, thanks to our leadership, Ontario's electricity system is more than 90 per cent free of greenhouse gas pollution. In fact, since shutting down coal-fired generation in Ontario, we've seen a dramatic increase in the quality of air. In 2005, Speaker, there were 53 smog advisories issued in Ontario. In 2016, Speaker, there were zero. Phasing out coal has saved Ontario $4.4 billion a year in health, environmental, and financial impacts. I'm really proud thank of you. Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Speaker, Ontario is recognized as a global leader in taking tough action to fight climate change. Through actions like implementing a cap on pollution, we can collaborate with other provinces and states to achieve meaningful emissions and reductions. While some politicians refuse to believe that climate change is real and a threat, let alone take action, subnational governments like Ontario are leading the way in the fight to save our planet. Can the minister please explain how Ontario is setting an example for other jurisdictions around the world to take serious, meaningful uh, action on tackling climate change? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again uh, to the member from Barrie for that question. 
Uh, as the member mentioned, Ontario is a global leader in fighting climate change. Speaker, uh, We're proud to be leading the way with a plan that, that guarantees emission reductions at the cheapest price possible for Ontarians. And we're investing millions of dollars in green programs like home <laughs> retrofits, bike lanes, incentives for businesses to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Our plan, Speaker, encourages innovation and it drives investment to help Ontario continue to be a leader in the low carbon economy. Meanwhile, Speaker, the opposition scheme would cost members of the public, would cost families and businesses significantly more money. Speaker, our plan is helping Ontarians yes, make more sustainable and affordable choices and guarantees a greener future for Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week's annual, general, uh, annual report from the Auditor General continues to shine the light on this government's waste and mismanagement. It was revealed that this government pays more for generic drugs than some Ontario hospitals, up to 85 per cent more. That's an extra $271 million taxpayers' dollars being spent on medication due to this government's inability to properly manage the system. That money could have gone to fund rare disease drugs or take-home cancer medication. Perhaps the government needs to switch priorities and have the hospitals negotiate generic drugs on their behalf. Can the Premier explain to the House why the people of Ontario continue to pay more and receive less from this government? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for this question. Um, we, uh, we are determined to get better prices for our drugs, and that's why Ontario took a leadership role when we cut the price of generic drugs in half wow. for all Ontarians. That was a, a policy that the member from uh, Elgin Middlesex London actually opposed and ran for the Progressive Conservative Party because he opposed them that much. So, Speaker, I just don't think he has a lot of credibility when it comes to supporting the reduction of uh, the price of drugs. Speaker, we have uh, uh, established the Pan-Canadian uh, Pharmaceutical Pricing uh, Network because so if we work as a country, Speaker, we will continue to drive prices down. Answer. And of course, bringing in PharmaCare for uh, for all people under age 25 will also give us more buying power, Thank you. which will reduce the price of drugs in the future. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the uh, Premier. And uh, when this government wants to go low on personal attack, I'll go high. And just go here, here. track record when it comes to waste and mismanagement is truly astonishing, but I think they've outdone themselves with this report. In 2015-16, the Minister of Health, Ministry of Health purchased nearly $1 million in prescription drugs for those who were already deceased. Only 42,000 of that $1 million was recovered by the ministry, which resulted in the taxpayers being on the hook for over $950,000. This government refuses to pay for take-home cancer treatments for the seriously ill and yet is fine with spending a million dollars on prescriptions for the dead. Will the Premier apologize for this gross oversight to those who continue to struggle, struggle to pay for medications, to pay for cancer treatments, Question. to pay for rare disease drugs in Ontario? Well, Speaker, I don't consider it a personal attack when someone's on the record as opposing a reduction in general. Never too late. A member from Nepean Carlton is warned. Speaker, as I was saying, I do not consider it a personal attack when someone is on the record as opposing a reduction in generic drugs in this province. That is a fact, Speaker. That is not a personal attack. Speaker, the work that we've done on the Ontario led Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance has successfully lowered drug prices for people in Ontario and in the country, saving a billion dollars each and every wow. year. Speaker. The cuts we made to the price of generic drugs speaker, is saving $500 million a year. It might be more now. That was the number a few years ago. Speaker. There is more work to do. And of course, the member opposite knows, because he is a pharmacist, that sometimes Answer. there are drugs for people in the last days of their life that are not used. Thank you.
there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.